I'm not ready to die, but I've got no time left. I'm going to disappear from this earth. I'm going to cease to exist. Those are the first words of Long Dream by Junji Ito. It's a collection of some of the most horrific thoughts any human can come to terms with. And yet, we do, sooner or later. The fact that one day, you will not be alive. That you will not be. That everything you've worked for will be beyond your grasp. That the constant tick, tick, ticking of the clock is the click, click, clacking of death's boot heel as he takes step after step to your door. But in some ways, isn't that better? Eternity is a blessing to a man in heaven, but a curse to the hellbound. From Homer and the dead in Hades, to Dante and the pits of hell, to Camus and Sisyphus's ceaseless struggle, writers have long since fixated on one simple question. What if the pain never stops? Today, I want to discuss two stories that examine this issue in tremendous detail. Long Dream by Junji Ito and The Jaunt by Stephen King. Masters of horror from across cultures, both equally fascinated by the breaking of a boundless mind. Before we dive in, I've left links in the description so you can read both stories for free, as well as purchase links if you'd like to support the writers. There's no way I can truly do justice to these two masterpieces, so I'm telling and then analyzing them in my own words. I definitely recommend that you have your own experience with both stories before I spoil it all for you. But before we start talking about the dread of a billion eternities of suffering, let's talk about something that can ease the dread of our own miserable lives. Today's sponsor, War Thunder. War Thunder is the free-to-play online military action game where you can engage in land, sea, and air combat on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and Mac. In it, you can experience epic battles across the globe, from the cockpit of a fighter jet, the belly of a tank, or even the deck of an entire battleship. War Thunder has a plethora of cutting-edge military equipment for you to employ against your enemies. From guided missiles, to strike drones, even a nuke that you can use to decimate the entire map. The team over at War Thunder is constantly updating the game's sights and sounds to create the most immersive experience possible. It's like being right in the middle of a Hollywood blockbuster. Of course, graphics aren't everything, which is why War Thunder is also committed to recreating the functionality of every vehicle in precise detail. It's a joy to behold for complete newbies and military vehicle enthusiasts alike. Once you've picked out your favorite vehicle, you can upgrade it with additional modules that affect its performance and appearance. There are tons of customization options available to you to ensure that your vehicle is truly one of a kind. My favorite thing about the whole game, however, is War Thunder's unique damage model. See, targeting different parts of a vehicle can actually disable them completely. You can target a tank's treads to halt its movement or shoot out its fuel tank to set it ablaze, or even target its crew to, uh, disable them completely. <laughs> War Thunder just released its newest update, Alpha Strike. Now, you can take to the skies like never before with Hungarian aviation, along with loads of new equipment, both modern and classic. In addition to massive updates to visual effects and gameplay balance, there's also a new map, North Holland. Here, you can engage in intense tank and aviation battles in the red light district, or create even more chaos in the shopping center. You can download War Thunder for free right now by using my link in the description. New players and returning players who haven't played in the last half year will receive rentals for the P-40E1 aircraft and the M4 tank for a week, along with free unique skins for both of them. You'll also receive a special decorator, Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, three free premium vehicles, a week premium account, and much more. But you have to hurry. The American vehicle bonus season is ending soon. And with that, thanks so much to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Now, let's dive into the horrors of the infinite. I'm going to cease to exist, muttered Mrs. Takashima, cowering from the shadow outside her room. This deep into the night, it was impossible to make out the shade's monstrous details but Takashima knew that the man on the other side of the doorway was no man at all. Her intuition was spot on. Tetsuro Mukuda had certainly been twisted beyond what might have been called human, and the most torturous fact of all was that he knew it too. He didn't understand why or how, but he knew that over the last few weeks, he had watched everything that had once been him crumble away. All that was left was a shambling sack of anxiety one that desperately wanted help. That was why he was here at this hospital to begin with. See, Tetsuro was experiencing a rather unusual phenomenon. A few months prior, he had begun having progressively longer dreams. Of course, at the outset, this was nothing too removed from the ordinary. 
It's normal for the occasional dream to feel like it lasts a day or two, maybe even a week. Tetsuro's dreams, however, began to span much greater lengths of time. First, they lasted a few days, then a week. A week turned into weeks, then a month. Even then, the dreams kept getting longer. Not only that, but they started to get longer, faster. After only a month, Tetsuro Mukada's dreams felt like he was experiencing entire years of his life, every single night. That marked a turning point. It was time to get help. One neurologist, Dr. Kuroda, took particular interest in Tetsuro's condition. Tetsuro did his best to explain his plight to the doctor without leaving out any details, but that was extremely difficult to do. While the symptoms had only begun a month ago, the last few nights had felt like years. Tetsuro was forced to discriminate between two entirely different timelines in his head, the one agreed upon by those healthy humans in the waking world, and the utterly expansive years of his own personal experience. It was starting to destroy his life, even remembering important events became nearly impossible. That said, establishing a timeline wasn't enough to fully describe the hell that he was just beginning to tumble into. As for the nature of the dreams themselves, well, Tetsuro explains that he might not have minded the experience if all the dreams were normal, pleasant dreams. He would have even accepted neutral dreams. But the nightmares. They were so bizarre that they eradicated Tetsuro's connection to reality entirely, pushing him to the brink of madness. Even so, he always managed to stick it out until morning. I suppose that's the mark of a resilient mind. Dr. Kuroda sat and quietly listened to Tetsuro's story. Naturally, he didn't believe the raving lunatic. After all, what kind of doctor would just believe their patient? But, at the very least, it confirmed that something was indeed wrong with the man, and that made it Kuroda's duty to help him. But what exactly was the odd individual suffering from that would cause him to come up with such delusions? At best, he assumed that the sleep-deprived man was simply suffering from an undocumented mental illness, maybe even just plain old insomnia. But no matter the case, it was best to admit the man to a room for observation for a few nights, just to make sure what the man's problem was. That began Tetsuro Mukada's two-month stay within Akira General Hospital, as well as the final years of his life. Far away, in another story altogether, nine mice scuttered about and tumbled over one another in a small, dark room. Even to the tiny rodents, it was cramped, and the stress of sudden relocation was only magnified by the jostling, shifting, and sliding they were now locked in. Dozens of sharp claws dug at the insides of the box, and a particularly disgruntled passenger let out a mighty war cry. Calm down already, Victor Karun said, thumping the squeaking box from Stackpole's house of pets. The critters simply screamed louder in protest as Karun's run-down pickup sped down the rough country back roads. If only they knew. Karun thought to himself. If only the rats, the mice, knew that they were about to make history. Earlier that day, Karun had been working in his lab. Well, to call it a lab was... generous. His government research grant afforded him rather little, so he worked out of an old barn. But it was an old barn full of lab equipment, nonetheless. He had been running an experiment, one that hoped to transport a tiny bit of matter, an ion, across a short space and through a lead sheet. He did this by setting two portals on either side of the sheet, with an ion gun at one portal and a cloud chamber at the far end of the other. It was an experiment in teleportation, albeit a modest one. All that work just to transport one little ion, and yet he had somehow done so much more. He had been tweaking the first of the portals that very morning when his fingers had passed through the narrow opening. His hip bumped a dial on his control panel and Karun became aware of a sudden vibrating sensation in his fingertips. When he looked to see what was producing the sensation, he saw two small, off-white rings sitting side by side. It only took a moment for him to process that he was seeing the insides of his index and middle fingers, sliced off just above the first knuckles. Blood gushed from the freshly severed digits, and he jerked his hand back in pain. Instinctively, he shoved the stumps into his mouth to soothe them, and... He didn't taste any blood. There wasn't any blood on the table that served as a base for the portal, either. Tentatively, he unplugged his fingers from his mouth and was astounded to see that the only injuries he had sustained were a couple of splinters. Splinters from the orange crates that were stacked up under the second portal. 
He stood in stunned silence for a moment, before carefully reaching for a pencil and slowly passing the sharpened point through the portal. The pointed graphite tip seemed to vanish before Karun's eyes. Now his whole body seemed to be vibrating, not because of the machine, but because of the utterly rattling magnitude of implication. This... this could change everything. He raced across the barn to the second portal, and sure enough, the other end of the pencil sat there on an orange crate some 150 feet away from where Karun had just been standing. It was a bit of a struggle to breathe at this point, but there was only one rational conclusion to draw from this. He needed to try something bigger. Even as Karun flew down his driveway in his pickup, he could scarcely believe that it had all happened by accident. This could set him up there with the likes of Bell and Edison. No, he was about to rise into a new league all his own. The box of rats, uh, mice, nearly toppled out of the passenger seat and into the floorboard as Karun slammed on the brakes. His time was short, very short indeed. He only had a few more hours of time allotted for use of the computer that ran his portals. After that, the U.S. government would cut him off from the network for the rest of the day. It was a way of controlling the already limited resources that they were providing him with. He snatched up the box of rodents and rushed inside, setting them down next to the portal. He opened the box, and with one trembling hand, being careful not to let the little pests nip his fingers, he gently grabbed onto one of the feisty warriors. It was soft and warm to the touch, but it squealed loudly in objection and squirmed like mad. Karun moved to send the mouse through the portal, but its desperation won out against the researcher's shaking hands. It leapt from his fingers and hit the barn floor with a soft smack before dashing through a hole in the wall. Karun scoffed. But this was why he bought nine of the little devils. The next mouse got an iron grip and was pushed face first through the portal. Just like with the pencil, Karun watched as its whiskers, nose, and head disappeared through the portal. Stepping around the other side, he could see the rodent's innards all working away, keeping it alive. It was like a live dissection, only more humane. He stuffed the rest of the mouse's butt through the portal and raced to the far end of the barn once more to observe it. He wasn't about to let this one get away from him. After all, the fuzzy fellow was about to be famous. He had just been the first ever rat, the uh, mouse, to teleport. The first living thing to experience instant traversal. Even as he ran to catch up to the celebrity, Karun was thinking of it now. The jaunt, he would call it after a science fiction book he had once read. When he arrived at the orange crates, it was all wrong. The mouse, so full of fire only a moment ago, was limp and breathing heavily. He poked at the shivering body, but it was like sticking his fingers into warm clay or wax. It offered no resistance or reaction. It just kept on sucking down one panicked breath after another, growing weaker and weaker until it stopped altogether dead. So much for being more humane. Dr. Kuroda stepped into Tetsuro's room. It was time to perform the tests that would verify what the man's condition actually was. Kuroda felt no small degree of satisfaction at the thought of dispelling the man's belief in this world of illusion. He only needed to see that what he was proposing was ridiculous. That would fix him. Tetsuro clearly felt anxious about the prospect of going to sleep again, but it was necessary. He was hooked up to various diagnostic machines. The lights were dimmed. Dr. Kuroda pulled a seat beside the bed and simply watched the man. No point taking notes. He had already assured himself that there would be nothing noteworthy during the night. Then, he waited. It took a while for the man to fall asleep, naturally. As the hours rolled by in the dark, subtle chill of the quiet hospital room, Kuroda worried that he himself might actually fall asleep before the patient did. His eyelids became gradually heavier, and his neck went slack. His shoulder drooped, and his head began to dip. Lower, lower. Tetsuro began violently convulsing in the bed, and Dr. Kuroda jolted to wakefulness once more. Was he having a seizure? Kuroda shot over to Tetsuro's side and began to try to rouse him from his fitful sleep. He shook the spasming man firmly, but to no avail. He wouldn't wake up. He tried screaming at him. Mr. Mukoda, you must wake up. Still, no response. The doctor reached for the patient's face and pushed apart his eyelids. Tetsuro's eyes darted about wildly, as if he were trying to look everywhere at once. Up and down, left and right, then directly into Kuroda's eyes. Then, he went totally limp again. Mouth agape, the doctor stepped away from the bed. He looked at the chart monitoring Tetsuro's brainwaves and noticed that he had just passed through REM sleep, the portion of the sleep cycle in which dreams are had. He had to know what had just happened. 
Once again, Kuroda attempted to shake Tetsuro from his sleep, and this time, the patient promptly awoke. Mr. Mukada, what happened? You were dreaming just then, weren't you? What? Where am I? He was drowsy, but not at all rested. You're in a hospital, don't you remember? You just checked yourself in yesterday on account of your dreams. Hospital? Dreams? Ah, yes. It was just a dream. Only a dream. The man looked absolutely mortified. Dr. Kuroda almost thought that he looked older. So you were dreaming? Yes. It was terrifying. And it lasted a year and a half. Tetsuro seemed to be watching something very distant through the hospital walls. It seemed crazy, but the data was right there on the machine. What's more, Dr. Kuroda got a sort of feeling about Tetsuro. He'd had patients lie to him before, sure, but he had to admit that wasn't the impression he got from Mukuda. Not after what he'd just seen, anyway. I'd like to keep you here for another night, Mukuda. Do... Do you think you can stop them? Desperation was evident in his voice. Let's... Let's just see how things go tomorrow night. Kuroda didn't have a clue whether or not there was anything that could be done for the man, but he wouldn't pass up the opportunity to study him. I'll speak with you again in the morning. Sleep well, Mr. Mukuda. When the following evening came around, everything proceeded in much the same way. Kuroda came in, dimmed the lights, sat down, and waited. The hours ticked by, but this time, Kuroda had no difficulty staying awake. His heart pounded in his chest. Long dream. Long dream. The words seemed to repeat themselves in Kuroda's mind. He tried to imagine what his patient must be experiencing. Even if the time in the dream was illusory, the concept was fascinating. It was as if Tetsuro's life was being artificially lengthened by the dreams. Years of life, added on in a single moment of REM sleep. The matter of the nightmares. Well, no sense focusing on the negatives. When Tetsuro's bed began shaking, this time, Dr. Kuroda simply sat and watched. The brainwave monitor once again started scratching in jagged, erratic lines indicating REM sleep. After a few moments, Tetsuro's arching body sunk back into the bed like a dead man. Kuroda reached out a hand to rouse the man, but then thought better of it. Best to let him sleep. Any questions that he had could be settled before the next observation. He had no expectation of discharging the patient anytime soon. The pair of them repeated this routine, night after night. Weeks passed, and as the dreams continued to grow longer, Tetsuro only became more anxious and fatigued. Kuroda constantly reassured Tetsuro that it was all in his head, and that they were doing everything they could to help him, but in reality they were making very little progress. Tetsuro accepted that it was an illusion, but it did little to console him. He told Kuroda about the dream he'd had that night, a nightmare in which he'd been a lone soldier in the jungle, running from an overwhelming enemy force. That dream had lasted ten whole years. The night before that had been spent cramming for tests that would never come. Nine years of scratching down panicked notes for a class that didn't exist. Before that, it had been eight years of searching for a toilet and finding no respite. But they're only illusions, Mr. Mukuda. There's nothing to fear. Only illusions. You can only say that because you have never dreamed as I have. Never felt how lonely. How lonely and filthy and terrifying they are. After 20 days of being in the hospital, Tetsuro's dreams seemed to last 50 years a night. It was so long that every morning, it was like interacting with a totally different person. His demeanor, his mannerisms, even his accent. It was like speaking to a time traveler who always returned to haunt the present day with memories of the horrors to come. Even his brain began to show signs that he really was experiencing these great lengths of time. The worst of all, however, was when it started to affect Tetsuro physically. At first, it seemed like he was aging rapidly from the stress. His hair started to go gray, then white, then it fell out entirely. The poor man's body was clearly dying from the lack of healthy sleep, or so the doctors thought. The changes only became more bizarre from there. His eyes glazed over and turned to milky white, like someone with severe cataracts. His balding head began to increase in diameter, his nose began to recede, 
and his skin became scaly and rough like a reptile. He remained conscious and rational, but it was like he was undergoing a process of... evolution. As though his body was adapting to that horrible dream world a bit more each night. That was how Tetsuro Mukura departed from the realm of humanity, and became a being that was only fit for dreams. Even so, the dreams grew longer still. One dead mouse wasn't about to get in the way of science, especially when there was no clear cause of death. Victor's fingers ventured back into the box of mice and returned with yet another intrepid adventurer. This one, Karun set on the table, and it voluntarily scurried through the portal and across the barn. Maybe that was the key. Yes, he had only been gripping the first mouse too tightly. He must have broken a rib and punctured its lung and all the excitement. Yes, that would be it. This mouse would do just fine since he had been so gentle with it. This hypothesis was quickly debunked when Karun arrived at the orange crates and found the second mouse slumped against the first, just as dead as its brother. Well, no need to focus on the negatives. He scooped both dead mice into a paper sack. He'd get a veterinarian to take a look at the pair later. After another several minutes of testing, it turned out that he'd be getting a veterinarian to look at seven dead mice instead of two. No matter how he put them in, it ended up the same way each time. He tried prompting them gently forcing them through, putting them through backwards, and even something somewhere in between, setting the mouse halfway through the portal and waiting for it to crawl through on its own. It didn't. The only survivors were the first mouse that had squeezed through the hole in the wall, and the mouse that Karun had put halfway through the portal backwards. It seemed like, so long as the mouse's head didn't complete the jaunt, the rodent could survive. That, or maybe the box of mice from Stackpole's House of Pets was full of duds, When Karun repeated the experiment with his own goldfish, that hypothesis, too, was ruled out. So, it really was the jaunt that was killing the animals. But why? They were just moving from one spot to another, and it wasn't even a particularly far journey. Not only that, but why did the mouse that was put halfway through the portal backwards survive? But what I really want to know is, what happened to the second mouse? And what about the second mouse? What happened to the second mouse? (sighs) Mark Oates' story about the invention of the jaunt was being well and truly derailed by his children's questions. The Oates family sat in the middle of a sickeningly sterile room, seated in a row of four rolling couches. They were in the middle of a jaunt terminal, something similar to an old world airport, but about 10,000 times more efficient. Their couches were situated among 96 others, 10 rows of 10. The low hum of hushed conversation surrounded them, dozens of other families and individuals trying to calm their nerves before the jaunt. Mark Oates' children were gathered close to him, listening to him tell the story of Victor Caroon. He had started telling the story as a way to calm his children's pre-jaunt jitters, but it was also an important history lesson. After all, Victor Caroon had changed the world when he discovered the jaunt 300 years or so ago. Now, as a result of Mark's work relocation to Mars, his children, Patty and Rick, were getting to live out a small slice of history. Daddy... What happened to the second mouse? For whatever reason, she had become fixated on the one part of the story Mark was most determined not to tell her, the fate of the mice that were completely jaunted. He had told his children that the mice didn't feel so good after they had gone through, but that wasn't the half of it, of course. Naturally, that meant he also couldn't tell them about Rudy Foggia and the human trials that had been conducted years later. No, even if Patty kept asking right up until the oats jaunt time, Mark wouldn't tell her. The whole point of telling her the story was to ease her nerves, and hearing, Well, you see, sweetie, they all immediately died moments after jaunting, would rattle her, like, well, a rattle. Mark had seen plenty of children who had to be forcibly held down and gassed by the anesthetists. It was barbaric, but what else were parents supposed to do? Leave their children behind on Earth? That simply wasn't an option, so the forced anesthesia was a necessary evil. Mark hoped to spare Patty that fate by keeping her cool and collected until jaunt time. His son, Ricky, inadvertently bailed his father out with another question. Dad, when did they start with people? Well, out of the frying pan and into the fire, I suppose. There were the human trials that Mark had been trying to avoid talking about, but at least they'd gone mostly all right. Well, Ricky, the first human trials weren't done with astronauts or test pilots or anything like that. Instead, they took six prisoners, put them to sleep, and sent them through a pair of portals two miles apart. 
It was an exceedingly oversimplified version of the events, but Mark wanted desperately to avoid touching on the barest mention of the seventh volunteer. He wanted to avoid it because touching on it meant implicitly touching on all the other rotten details surrounding the jaunt. The murders, the mob connections, the missing people, all of it. It all started with the seventh volunteer, Rudy Fujia. Fujia had been a serial killer. He had been arrested for butchering several elderly people at a bridge party. He was a murderer, a monster, and in no uncertain terms, a real jerk. That made him the prime candidate for one of the most important experiments in the history of the jaunt. A conscious jaunt. Long before the U.S. government had ever decided to send people through the portals, they had realized one fundamental truth of the jaunt. It was only deadly if you were awake. The animal trials had proved this over and over, but researchers were still curious. What was it like? What would happen to the man who jaunted while he was awake? It was easy enough getting Rudy to agree to it. He had nothing to lose and everything to gain. His freedom, his life, and a chicken dinner. That's right, that's everything that Rudy requested in exchange for going through the portal. He expected it to kill him, of course, but what did it matter if he died here or in an electric chair? His short, pathetic life would be over, all the same. So they stood Rudy in front of a team of scientists and a portal. The same portal that the other six candidates had been wheeled through. But Rudy wasn't going to be wheeled through. He would be stepping through the gateway on his own two feet, and in an instant, it would all be over. He'd be on the other side, surrounded by an entirely different group of researchers. He took one step, two steps, then through the portal he went. It was like a different man stepped out on the other side. His hair had gone as white as the mice that Karun had killed with the jaunt all those years ago. His face was slack and stunned. He didn't speak a word or take another step until the researchers asked him a single question. What did you see? Fogia croaked out four words before his lifeless body slumped to the floor. Is your family ready? Mark's head shot up at the jaunt attendant's question. He hadn't even noticed her pushing the squeaking cart up their aisle. He had been so lost in thought. Time already? Oh, but we were just about to get to the good stuff, Mark said with a wink towards his son. In reality, Mark was supremely relieved that their jaunt time had arrived. He loved answering his children's questions, but he doubted he'd make it much longer without letting out some grim truth. Daddy, I'm scared. It's okay, sweetheart. There's nothing to be worried about. Will it hurt? No, dear, I promise. You'll be just fine. Look, here, I'll even go first. He gestured to the attendant that he was ready for the mask. The attendant handed it to him, and he slipped it over his face. He looked at his daughter and gave her a wink, too. Finally, his eyes passed over to Ricky, who was now eagerly grabbing at his own mask. Mark took a deep breath of the gas, and he watched as his son's wide grin was swallowed by the shadow of sleep. What happens to the man who wakes up from an endless dream? Tetsuro muttered the words through thin, piecing lips. The whole room seemed dark now. His eyes had adapted for a world without light, a world that only existed in his mind, a world more vast and terrible than the one he was rotting away in now. Even so, he could vaguely make out the shape of Dr. Kuroda, sitting in the dark with him, just like every night. Kuroda didn't say a word. A few days earlier, or was it a few years, Dr. Kuroda and another doctor had dragged Tetsuro weeping through the halls of the hospital. That was okay, though. He deserved it. That morning, he had woken up from a dream that had lasted thousands upon thousands of years. Millennia of pure bliss. He had spent those years in the arms of the woman he loved, Mami Takashima. In the waking world, they had never truly met. She had simply been the face of another patient who passed by the doorway to Tetsuro's room. But for Tetsuro, the waking world had ceased to be more real than the world of dreams and nightmares. There had been nothing more true to him than her constant embrace, even if she had screamed and screamed when they finally met face to face. He had burst into her room, terrifying her. Death, she called him. Death. Unbeknownst to Tetsuro, he had become the icon of that which Takashima feared the most. Death. She was horrified by the idea that someday it would all end. 
that she would disappear from this earth, that she would cease to exist. I don't know, Mr. Mukuda. I doubt that such a thing is even possible. After all, an endless dream would have no end. Morning would never arrive for you. But the sun will rise again, Dr. Kuroda. The way he said such a hopeful thing so grimly. And you will rouse me all the same. Only hours later, the morning will come for you and for Takashima. Tetsuro spoke as he always did, like a man out of time and space, like a visitor from another dimension. And yet Kuroda knew that only a month ago, he had been an average man. Will you wait with me? There was fear in his voice. That same frightened man was still there, living in the body of the monster that seemed to melt into the hospital bed. Of course, Tetsuro. Tetsuro no longer struggled to fall asleep. His body seemed to yearn for it constantly. Even so, Kuroda sat and waited. When Tetsuro slipped into another dream, his body rocked and shuddered like never before. But Kuroda knew there was nothing he could do. He just watched it seize and writhe, then fall still once more. Several hours later, the doctor had not moved. In the dark, the half-man looked like something that had crawled out of the deep sea, or perhaps flown here from some faraway planet. No, Kuroda thought. He was from a much further and stranger place still. Then the sun started to rise. As the sun rose over the jaunt station on Mars, vision slowly returned to Mark Oates. He could see straight through the glass dome covering the terminal, out into the infinite expanse of stars that humanity was yet to conquer. As he woke, some latent chemical in his brain still lingered on the image of Rudy Fujio's last moments stumbling out of the jaunt portal. The white-haired criminal had only managed four simple words. It's eternity in there. The words echoed painfully in Mark's head like a migraine, or maybe that was just the sun in his eyes. Then, he heard the screams. The sunlight touched Tetsuro's crooked face. Kuroda had started to slip into a dream of his own, but he woke when he heard a sharp crack in the room. It had been Tetsuro's skull. The sunlight inched along the monster's face, crushing it as if some infinite weight was contained in each photon. After only a moment, there was nothing but dust left in Tetsuro's bed, and even that faded seconds later. All that remained of Tetsuro Mukura was a small crystal resting on his pillow. Mark immediately recognized his wife's voice in the scream. He struggled up from the jaunt couch, fighting the waves of dizziness. There was another scream, and he saw jaunt attendants running towards their couches, their bright red jumpers flying around their knees. Marilis staggered towards him, pointing. She screamed again, and then collapsed on the floor, sending an unoccupied jaunt couch rolling slowly down the aisle with one weakly clutching hand. But Mark had already followed the direction of her pointing finger. He had seen. It hadn't been fright in Ricky's eyes. It had been excitement. He should have known because he knew Ricky. Ricky, who had fallen out of the highest crotch of the tree in their backyard in Synecdoche when he was only seven, who had broken his arm and was lucky that had been all he'd broken. Ricky, who dared to go faster and further on his slide board than any other kid in the neighborhood. Ricky, who was first to take on any dare. Ricky and Fear were not well acquainted. Until now. Beside Ricky, his sister still mercifully slept. The thing that had been his son bounced and writhed on its jaunt couch. A 12-year-old boy with a snow-white fall of hair and eyes that were incredibly ancient. The cornea has gone a sickly yellow. Here was a creature, older than time, masquerading as a boy. And yet, it bounced and writhed with a kind of horrid, obscene glee. And at its choked, lunatic cackles, the jaunt attendants drew back in horror. Some of them fled, although they had been trained to cope with just such an unthinkable eventuality. The old, young legs twitched and quivered, Claw hands beat and twisted and danced on the air. Abruptly, they descended, and the thing that had been his son began to claw at its face. Longer than you think, Dad. It cackled. Longer than you think. 
Held my breath when they gave me the gas. Wanted to see. I saw. I saw. Longer than you think. Cackling and screeching. The thing on the jaunt couch suddenly clawed its own eyes out. Blood gouted. The room was an aviary of screaming voices now. Longer than you think, Dad. I saw. I saw. Long jaunt. Longer than you think. It said other things before the jaunt attendants were finally able to bear it away, rolling its couch swiftly away as it screamed and clawed at the eyes that had seen the unseeable forever and ever. It said other things, and then it began to scream. But Mark Oates didn't hear it, because by then, he was screaming himself. Long jaunt. Long dream. Longer than you think. I hope you enjoyed that last passage. It's perfect as King wrote it, so it would have felt wrong altering it in any way. But let's get into the analysis. What really happened here? Naturally, these stories aren't canonically related, but they're conceptually very similar. Both stories are about time. They're about the split between experience and concrete reality. Most importantly, they're about suffering. For every serial killer in the night, every monster in the shadows, every hateful demon, there's only so much that they can ever do to you. The killer can only carve out so much flesh, the monster can only instill so much fear, and the demon invokes so much corruption. They may kill you, but then it's over. You've disappeared from the earth, and you've ceased to exist. Long Dream and the Jaunt rob their characters of that last comfort. Death. The great and terrible end of all suffering. Of course, they do this in subtly different ways. The Jaunt subjects its characters to the misery found in your own soul. I had to leave out a few details for the sake of time, but there's a terrific line towards the end of the story that sums it all up quite nicely. Your mind can be your best friend. It can keep you amused even when there's nothing to read, nothing to do but it can turn on you when it's left with no input for too long. It can turn on you, which means it turns on itself, savages itself, perhaps consumes itself in an unthinkable act of auto-cannibalism. Unthinkable indeed. Humans are remarkable in the sense that we, as finite beings, are blessed with the ability to comprehend the infinite. That might sound wrong at first, but let me explain. It's true that our minds can't contain an infinite amount of information. But mathematicians have long been aware of certain shortcuts that allow us to use the infinite to solve problems and to develop a more complete picture of reality. For example, mathematicians don't define infinity by starting to count one, two, three, four, and so on. Instead, we can define it as the number of elements in the set of all natural numbers. Now there's a number we can work with. But Ricky and Tetsuro didn't have a mere comprehension of the infinite. Instead, they had a complete and intimate experience of the fullness of eternity. Every moment, every thought, followed by another, and another, and another, and another, and another. A ceaseless sequence of ideas, breakthroughs, revelations, disappointments, breakdowns, and despair that goes on and on, never ending. Until there Ricky was, standing in the middle of the jaunt terminal. It was impossible, and yet there he was. Likewise, Tetsuro was trapped in the eternal dream. Sure, there may have been a stimulus in the dream with him, some sort of horrific reality to keep his mind from cannibalizing itself, but what's truly worse? To grapple eternally with your own inner demons, or to be in the hands of something more evil than yourself? I find it hard to say one way or the other. And after an eternity of torture, or perhaps bliss, Tetsuro too woke up to see the sun. Ultimately, the horror lurking at the core of both of these stories is the same. Infinity in an instant. Junji Ito in particular seems to have an interest in taking abstract ideas from math and turning them into something terrifying. Uzumaki has the spiral, Layers of Fear has, well, layers, and Long Dream has the super task. 
In mathematics, a supertask is the concept of taking an infinite sequence of distinct tasks and performing each task faster and faster until eventually the time it takes to complete each task converges to zero, at which point the rest of the tasks basically happen instantaneously. The point of this is that it allows you to, hypothetically, contain an infinite sequence within a finite amount of time. Uh, look, imagine you had a cake and you cut it in half. The volume of the cake didn't change, but the surface area has increased because the inside faces of the cake are now showing. Now cut one half of the cake into quarters, and the same thing happens. Volume stays the same, surface area goes up. Repeat this process infinitely, and you end up with an infinite amount of surface area. Now, just like it's impossible to wake up from an eternal dream that you experience one second at a time, likewise, you can never actually cut a cake in this manner. Not without applying a super task to it. To include a super task into this example, you would have to get faster and faster. Infinitely fast, actually, but let's just assume that you're really good at cutting cake. You set a stopwatch for one minute and cut the cake in half. After 30 seconds, you cut the half into quarters. Another 15 seconds goes by, and you cut the quarters into eighths. Seven and a half seconds into sixteenths, three and three quarter seconds, and the sixteenths become 30 seconds. Keep going, and by the time this minute is up, you're done. The cake has been infinitely subdivided. That's a super task. Now, that example I just gave about the cake actually comes from the last bit of media I wanted to share with you today. It's a video by none other than... Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. Where are your fingers? It goes into much greater depth on super tasks than I'm willing or capable to in this video. So please, please go check it out. It's one of the best videos on YouTube and you won't regret it. Okay, so how does that relate to the stories we just went over? Well, Ricky and Tetsuro both went through an infinite mental sequence then came out on the other side of eternity. Their experience of time was infinite, but contained within the finite time passing by in the real world. In Long Dream, Tetsuro's dreams always start the same way, with his body spasming in the hospital bed. At the end of the story, he expenses an infinite string of thoughts and feelings, but it gets compressed down into those few quaking moments of REM sleep. Super task. Likewise, in the jaunt, we actually know how long the jaunt takes to complete, less than one billionth of a second. It must be the super task of all super tasks, since Ricky's infinity is trapped in this inconceivable fraction. At least Tetsuro's spanned a few seconds. But this all leads back to an even greater issue. Sure, we might be able to rationalize their experience. We might be able to explain it away with math and say, ah, it really did happen in an instant. But what good does that do Ricky? Or Tetsuro? Or heck, even Rudy Fogia. It does nothing for them. Because by the time that they've returned to us in the real world, it's already too late for them. It was already too late an eternity ago. And an eternity before that. It doesn't take long for the long dream or the long jaunt to become more real than your old life ever was. But then again... No sense focusing on the negatives. Dr. Kuroda took the crystal from Tetsuro's pillow. That had been the cause of all of it. The dreams, the transformation, and the abundance of life that Mr. Mukura had been fortunate enough to experience. Or perhaps it was the dreams that had grown the crystal in Mukura's brain like a tumor. Another adaptation for life in the endless dream. He held in his hands immortality distilled into physical substance. It didn't take long to put two and two together. Miss Takeshima's greatest fear was that one day she would cease to exist. And now, Dr. Kuroda need only administer her cure. I'm Chromudgeon. Thanks for watching. <laughs>